Hi, everyone. Okay, Tate, hey, looks like we're ready to go. How are hey, you? Sam. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? Uh, I'm very well. Okay, so thanks everyone for coming. We're very excited to talk to you today about a kind of um, subtopic within the emerging genre of uh, profit sharing communities, which is usage mining. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to give a brief ish presentation <laughs> um, about some of the aspects of usage mining, what it is, uh, some of the things we can learn from the existing, what do you say, like prior work in the, in the DeFi space. Um, recently, and then Tate's going to tell us about a project that he and the rest of the Verso team have been working on, which is uh, heavily related to this. So, yeah, uh, I guess to get started, I'll share my screen. Uh, and Tate, if you could tell me when you see this, that I would be great. See it. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. <laughs> All right, so usage mining. Uh, the idea of this presentation is just to give a brief overview of what it is um, and the things we can learn from the summer of. Uh, degeneracy, as the <laughs> DeFi people like to, to call themselves, DGENs. Uh, so quickly, what is usage mining? It's the process of earning um, rewards as an early user of an application um, in the form of ownership of the application itself. Um, yes, so the idea here is that what we're building on Arweave is not just kind of companies with web services that have uh, the typical structure that we that we know from the centralized web. We're trying to build something new and um, what would you say a, a revolution on top of that? At least a, a a strong evolutionary step, if not a full revolution of how that system should work. And and one of the things you'll find is that while trying to build a community around your application, so a community that can take part in governance um, and control of the application, and also push it forward and decide you know what features need to be built. Um, and the likes, and help those actually get get done, so that it's not all on the founder to create everything from scratch. Um, yeah, what you'll find is that you you want there to be distribution of those tokens, uh, yeah, of that ownership stake to people um, in some form. And one of the ways to do that, of course, is for there to be some kind of uh, sale of the tokens to people. And this has complex regulatory, uh, let's say, implications, uh, which aren't really very well. Um, Crystallize, I would suppose, in most countries around the world at this point. Um, but another way you can do it is giving rewards to people uh, for usage of the application itself. And this has really nice dual incentives. So it, it solves this problem of how am I going to get a, a large crowd of people to have buy-in and ownership of this application I'm building, as well as making sure that uh, the people that are uh, the eventual owners of the community or stakes in the community are, you would say, people that are, are truly invested in its success. And the best people to do that is generally the users of the community itself. So with that in mind, let's kind of jump into the things that we've learned so far. I would say this concept has been like floating around in, in some form in crypto for quite a while, but it really wasn't until the summer of 2020, just, just earlier this year, that this started to kick into high gear. And it did so for the first time with uh, DeFi. So <laughs> we can see this pretty uh, clearly on this chart, which basically shows how, um, yeah, usage incentives or, or, or usage mining of some kind was used in a large number of protocols in the DeFi space um, to push, uh, yeah, push adoption of the protocols that the people were building, uh, generate communities around them, um, and also just decentralize ownership and control of those protocols. Uh, it was a pretty rapid rise once people got hold of this idea, which happened uh, around the time that, that Compound started its program like this. I think Synthetics actually did this first quite a while ago, but but it didn't really catch on. Like it didn't um, it didn't balloon in the same way that it did after the Compound um, events started to happen, and then Wi-Fi and so on. But the interesting thing we can see is that over the last 90 days or so. It, this trend has very clearly kind of tailed off a bit. Like the excitement is really out of this, what I think it's fair to say was a, an economic bubble. Um, okay, but that's, that's kind of cool for us because it means that this is a great time to take stock, see what we've learned, and see how that can be applied to the profit sharing communities that we're founding on top of the Arweave protocol. So here's some lessons. And I think the first should be obvious to uh, all of us, but how would you say? Sometimes in life when things 
it's easy to intellectually understand things. It's harder to, to really grep them at their core. And I think the key takeaway from all of this is just incentives always win. That is, whatever you incentivize people to do is in general what they will do. Um, I think Warren Buffett's co-CEO or co-investment chief uh, Berkshire Hathaway says it quite nicely in, um, in that uh, you show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcomes. And so this was demonstrated very, very clearly in the, uh, the DeFi space through the Sushi Swap and Uniswap incident. So Sushi Swap comes along, uh, when's that, August 26th, and creates a new protocol, basically just a fork of Uniswap, which doesn't currently have a token at, at this time. Um, and it says, hey, we're adding a token to Uniswap. It's the same thing, but we're also going to reward you, at least to begin with, uh, for providing liquidity on Uniswap. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. So you see that before August 20, uh, there's there's kind of relatively low liquidity provision inside uh, Uniswap and SushiSwap. And then, rapidly around this time, people start to provide the tokens that were previously in their wallets to this contract, and they, they start uh, staking them in order to gain rewards in the form of sushi, which is, I think, one of those, in retrospect, we'll look back on this as a very ridiculous meme. But <laughs> there are, there are um, very valuable things we can learn from the incident. So you get sushi by staking your tokens. Fine. And you see that relative to the amount of, um, yeah, the amount of tokens that were staked inside Uniswap to begin with, so uh, providing liquidity essentially for the uh, automated market making service, it, the, the adoption balloons extraordinarily rapidly. That's really interesting as a trend. So, so if you're thinking about this purely from Uniswap's point of view, you're saying, wow, this just works. Like you, you give people ownership of something, even if it's not actually the same protocol as we would, we would recommend in a profit sharing community generally, you should give the ownership of the, the protocol that people are using uh, to the people using it. But, but in this case, it was you provide liquidity inside Uniswap and you get sushi from sushi swap protocol. Okay. So fine. It, it worked. People were given an incentive and they responded by staking drastically larger amounts of capital. And then around uh, September 8th, the, the so-called so migration happened where tokens were moved, um, from the sushi, sorry, from the Uniswap protocol into SushiSwap. So the rewards, instead of being for providing liquidity inside Uniswap, were moved to SushiSwap. So this is kind of the, the protocol. Yeah, people are being rewarded, um, in the protocol token that, of the protocol they're using now. And you see that rapidly, a huge amount of this capital, and we're talking about, if we're reading this chart right, you know, somewhere between 0.75 to over a billion dollars uh, moved rapidly from Uniswap to SushiSwap. And then when Uniswap launched and uh, in between SushiSwap had got, undergone some, let's call it like uh, brand branding issues <laughs> uh, with trust in the, in the, uh, the Chef Nomi uh, storyline and all of the rest of it, then Uniswap launched its token and then people rapidly moved back because Uniswap's token was more valuable and they were being rewarded in that. So they were simply incentivized to go and uh, provide their liquidity again on Uniswap. And they came out of the end of this whole uh, sort of episode much, much stronger. You see the difference between August 20th and, and I don't know where that graph stops, but I guess like uh, early October. We're talking about 10x or 15x the amount of liquidity being provided. So we can see pretty clearly here, incentives always win. People are just in the, at least in the DeFi space, they're just following the incentives that lay down in front of them. Uh, yes, here's a, a one that, that wouldn't necessarily um, jump out at you, but, but I think we have kind of learned pretty uh, strongly in, in the DeFi space, is pseudonymous founders lead to healthy trust minimization. That is, because people don't know who pseudonymous founders are, they don't trust them by default. And because they don't trust them, they audit the code that is produced uh, in a in a more, would you say, uh, comprehensive manner as a community. And they also take stronger ownership of the project itself as a community. And and this is really interesting. I was one evening 
um, watching some of these Telegram channels where these uh, uh, DeFi DGen types hang out, and they're starting to talk about this protocol called uh, Pasta, which, you know, another food coin. Um, I think it doesn't offend anyone if I say probably not, um, <laughs> probably not the most valuable long term. But people are looking at this like, okay, so along comes this Pasta Chef guy, and he's saying there's a great new protocol. It's got some very tiny modifications on top of, I think, what the, the uh, Wi-Fi, uh, Wi-Fi um, contracts, or potentially, no, it was Yam. Yeah, it, it was a it was a fork of the Yam uh, contracts. And I don't know, it had some vaguely interesting economic twist to it. I think it was something like uh, when you send tokens, one percent of the tokens get burned, or something like this. So kind of deflationary in nature. But anyway, that was the twist. But so along comes this kind of pastor chef person, and they're like, the community is like, okay, we obviously we don't trust this person at all. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to compare the contracts to the YAM contracts. We're going to see what lines have changed. And through the incentives that are produced that we were speaking about in kind of lesson number one, as well as the, um, would you say the, the mistrust of the founders or the lack of trust, if not uh, mistrust, uh, the community very, very rapidly developed a completely coherent understanding of the protocol they'd been presented with. And subsequently, as a group of people, they're just in a much stronger position to make modifications to it and to vote on its governance at a later point in time. So I think that this is actually something that could be used to great effect in the profit sharing community ecosystem. Uh, yeah, and it's something that's kind of underexplored, I would say. Okay, another key lesson I would say is that decentralized media is moving uh, much, much faster than centralized media. This is important if you're a profit sharing token founder or a profit sharing community founder, because it, it really kind of informs where you should be putting your efforts in terms of distribution of your message. So at the moment, you might be thinking that uh, getting an article in the block or something like this is going to cause adoption of your protocol or of your profit sharing community. Um, but, but I would, I think that one of the lessons from the DeFi wave was that that probably isn't true. Actually getting lots of people talking about it on Twitter is more likely to be effective. And just one interesting example of this <laughs> is like um, Cointelegraph on uh, September 11th saying, DeFi is a once in a decade investment opportunity, true or false. It could be a huge investment opportunity or a bubble ready to burst or both. And it's like everybody in the DeFi space, but long before uh, September 11th realized that this was a bubble. There was very, very little um, ambiguity on that point, I think. And so you can just see here that like, the centralized media was playing catch up the whole summer uh, versus the decentralized media, the, the Twitter and the, the, well, yeah, the Twitter feeds and the um, Telegram channels which were way out in front on the on the bleeding edge of this stuff. So I think that we can kind of use that to inform our decisions about, yeah, how we should prioritize getting the word out there. There's a lot more to say here, but, but we don't really have time. Okay, fourth, governance participation incentives are not solved at all. This is, a, this is one that as profit sharing community founders, as the ecosystem as a whole, we're gonna have to come to, uh, yeah, some conclusions about ourselves. And I, I expect that a lot of this will will involve experimentation and uh, evolution of the profit sharing community contracts themselves. Obviously, they're all open source. There's been a community XYZ opportunity for someone to come along, make it so that there's a little button where you can say, upload this contract. Don't use a, a normal profit sharing community contract. Use a, a forked version of some kind, uh, which I'm sure someone will fulfill soon. So there, there should be the opportunity to experiment with this, uh, yeah, with the contract design itself much, much earlier in the process. And of course, you can just deploy the contract if you want, uh, without using the community XYZ, uh, wizard if you, if you want to call it that way. Um, yes, and then just use it inside communities XYZ. You just go to the appropriate address. But critically, if we look at the engagement of token holders, in governance inside these decentralized protocols, we see that there are pretty, yeah, there are some pretty fundamental issues at stake. Like fundamentally, people just aren't incentivized to take part appropriately. 
Um, this is Uniswap. So Uniswap's first governance proposal <laughs> was after they realized that the the quorum quantities were far too high. So the number of tokens that had to take part in the vote in order for it to be uh, accepted, even if everybody is for the vote, um, was I think 40 million tokens. Um, and that equates to, at the time that this was going on, it was something like 220, 240 million dollars had to, yeah, million dollars worth of tokens had to vote uh, on an issue before you reached quorum. And the first vote was to lower this pretty dramatically because that was just far too high to get people to actually take part in the governance and get uh, important and necessary proposals through. And eventually this vote failed. I think they were 39.4 million uh, uni voting or no, maybe, yeah, I think there was 39.4 million uni voting in total, and it was 38 point whatever million voting for and 600,000 voting against. And this means that the, the protocol is kind of stuck until they can muster the excitement and interest from the community to actually vote on this thing. So this is a pretty fundamental problem, which begs the question when you are uh, setting up your community on community XYZ, what kind of quorum values should you use? It's an interesting question you'll want to think carefully about. Uh, and I think the fundamental problem here is that there's just no good incentives to take part in governance. Uh, there's lots of things we could do to, to change this, like simply rewarding people that vote, but they all take a little bit of time and, and to be thought through and to be experimented with. Here's another problem that emerged. So with Curve Finance, um, which has a DAO inside it now. Uh, one of the founders, because of the way the voting power was calculated, one of the founders ended up with 71% of the voting share, which just obviously can't really be said to be a decentralized autonomous organization at all. It's just centralized. So there is a lot of really interesting work in, into how you might be able to solve this problem. Uh, one of them is Futaki, which is a system whereby you essentially reward people that voted um, for economically positive outcomes down the line, uh, yes, for their vote at the time. And there's lots of different ways you can structure this. There's a really interesting blog post about it by uh, Vitalik from 2014. You might want to go take a look, look at. More basic uh, structures could include just giving a few tokens to people uh, when they take part in a vote that passes, or potentially even a vote that fails as well. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff we could we could look at. But yeah, I, it would be great if we could talk more about this as a community, I think. So final lesson, uh, markets can still stay irrational uh, longer than you can stay solvent. Um, even though everyone knew that the DeFi wave was obviously a bubble, uh, it, it still you know, lasted far longer than, than you would have anticipated that it would. And part of that is like, I saw this described by someone somewhere along the journey as, uh, they were talking to their friend or something and they said, well, you can be right about the fact that none of these protocols, PASTA, whatever it happens to be today, uh, have any value. Then you'll be poor. <laughs> I'm just going to go along with what I what I think the crowd is going to do, and I'll be rich. So even if it makes no sense, um, then there actually might be an economic uh, incentive to take part, at least for some time. And I think that this is uh, as protocol, yeah, profit sharing communities on top of uh, are we if it start to become more and more liquid. We're going to have to watch out for some of these uh, issues arising. So anyway, that's a kind of explanation, or what did you say? Exploration of some of the issues that, that have come up in DeFi when people have used um, reward mechanisms, some of them positive. Uh, the, the power of the incentive systems themselves, very clearly uh, something that can be positive if used appropriately, but also some pitfalls that we'll want to avoid. I think in general, though, <laughs> the power of that first one is just so obvious for pushing adoption of these of these systems that we we can um, yeah we can work around some of the other issues and I think that over time as profit sharing communities grow and as an ecosystem we have these debates and discussions and experiments with people trying out different mechanisms um, we'll kind of come to learn how would you say yeah we'll come to learn best practices so I think one thing that we can do as a community up front is is be really transparent and say okay well I'm going to try it this way. You try it that way and let's see what happens. 
let's learn from it and, and get back together, hopefully, in future programs, uh, if not later in this program, and discuss those how those experiments went in practice, what we can learn, put together playbooks to help new founders um, make the most of the, the good side of this, uh, while also being aware and, and avoiding the downsides, potential downsides, if not executed correctly. OK, so that kind of uh, overview of the positive sides and the massive caveats that we ought to be careful of aside, uh, yeah, Tate, it would be great if you could tell us about what you and the um, Verto team have been working on to actually allow us to build uh, usage mining systems in practice on top of uh, our weave, like today. I think, if I'm understanding correctly, this is kind of launching like right now. Yes, right now. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Let me uh, let me share my screen really quick. Um, okay, and and just let me know if if you can see this. I can indeed. Awesome. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, okay, so hey everybody, my name's Tate Berenbaum. I'm um, a co-founder of, of Verto, and I'm here to present uh, Astatine, which is uh, a project that we've a few of us have been working on for for a couple weeks now and and we're finally to the point where we're ready to like you know give it out to the community to 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 use it um <laughs> so what it is is it's a profit sharing token distribution mechanism um in its most simplest terms um so so why does something like this uh why would something like this be necessary for the ecosystem um, well, right now, it's, it's, it can be kind of difficult to build a community um, without, you know, finding some, some interesting ways to, to get your tokens out there, um, especially like for, for attracting people to the DAO, getting community members to get in those DAO votes, as Sam was kind of talking about earlier. Um, it, it's really, really necessary if you're trying to seed the market quickly and, and efficiently and easily. And it can also offer things like mining rewards if you if you structure this strategically. Um, so I'll, I'll go a little bit more into depth about this later. Uh, but but right now, just keep in mind, like you can use this technology not only to just distribute tokens to to people um, for whatever reason, but you can also use it to distribute to to people that are performing a service on on your uh, community. So like mining, especially that's a that's a good example. Um, okay, so, so what it is, in its, um, right now at least, it's powered through GitHub. It's a, the, the technology itself runs automatically on a cron job through a GitHub action. Um, and we did this because we wanted it to be super easy for people to, um, to, to, you know, fork it and, and get it, get it running as soon as they can. Uh, we're just trying to get this technology out to people so that they can be using it. Um, but there, there are a lot of different ways that this same uh, mechanism can can be achieved. And so I'll also talk a little bit about that um, because I think that for the long term, at least, this is a very short term solution. It's, you know, it's centralized uh, because it's controlled by not only GitHub, but also you because you're controlling the, the repository. Uh, but a long-term solution would be to decentralize this infrastructure. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can find it on github.com slash Maximus Black, uh, spelled BLK, um, and Astatine. So, so it's super easy to use. Um, all you have to do is you fork the repository. Um, you can configure the repository and push your configuration to the master branch. And then you're off to the races. Um, so let me see if I can go to this really quick and show you what it looks like on my end uh, because I have configured this. Um, okay, so yeah, this is a fork of, of Max's repository. Um, and, you know, you can see the documentation here, how, how to use it, what everything stands for. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what it looks like. Um, everything runs through GitHub Actions, as I said, it's a workflow. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty cool because you can actually see like all of the times that it has been running. Uh, so you can see an hour ago, an hour ago, an hour ago, 24 minutes ago. Now it's it's running now. Um, and it records all of the all of the distributions that it does 
on this um, status file right here. So you can see exactly um, what time it got started. You can see the balance. It looks like this has run out um, of balance, so it's not distributing anymore. Um, but yeah, you can see exactly how many tokens it distributes, and these are the transaction IDs of, of every distribution. So, so right here, I only have it configured to distribute to one wallet address, which is why it's only one transaction. Um, but it's, like I said, it's configurable. So you can set it to, um, to support a function that returns wallet addresses to distribute to. Um, so let me get back to the presentation here. Um, oh, I need to click the present button again. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you're probably asking like, okay, that's cool, but this looks like a lot of math. How do I configure this? Um, see, this was a lot of math and we we kind of um, stumbled for a bit on trying to figure out the easiest way to allow people to 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 use this without ne needing to know like multivariable calculus um, and we found that the easiest way was actually by making uh, interactive desmos graphs so what that is let me transfer again here um, what this graph does is it allows you to, to play around with the values and see how many tokens will be distributed um, and over like what length of time. Um, and also you can mess around with the at which each distribution occurs. So like I said, it's interactive. So you, you can edit these numbers real time and see how it reflects on the graph uh, with, the, with, the, sorry, with the number of tokens that are distributed as well. Um, and these values here, 6,265, 8,600, uh, all you do, you copy these numbers and you can paste them into the configuration. So let me go back to the presentation again. Okay. Yeah, so there's a, a config.js file, and, and all you do is you, you go in there, um, <laughs> easiest copy-paste. So initial emit amount, time interval, period at, at which the emission takes place and then the decay constant. Um, this is for exponential. We, we have one for linear as well, as I said, or as that picture displays right there. Um, and you can also see these, the, you can find these graphs on the repository uh, while you're looking through the documentation. So you can, you know, you won't, <laughs> you, you won't lose it. You can access that anytime. Um, Cool. So the one big thing that, that really unlocks a lot of potential in, in this distribution system is what we're calling the token allocation function. Um, so what that is, is it's a function that any developer, um, when they fork this repository, they need to uh, write themselves. Uh, but what it does is it allows developers to say, okay, I only want to distribute to this many people and I want to specify who I want to distribute to at this given time. Um, so it, it, it's a function which allows you to, to do all these things. Um, sorry, but, but basically this means that you can, you can choose however you want to distribute to. You can choose who, you can make it random. You can um, reward early users of, of the community, or you can reward early people that, that got into Arweave, the early adopters. Um, and you can also choose to reward, as I mentioned before, like mining. So if you have people that are running services, like for Virto, at least, we have a network of trading posts. So we could set this, this system up to automatically reward trading posts over time. Um, since, you know, for the services that they're providing to the, to the network. Um, so yeah, it's, it's super modular and, and customizable to, to whatever you need. Um, which, you know, we, we think is really important because there are a lot of different ways that you could end up configuring this. Um, as Sam said, I, I think the best way to, to, to figure out like what the best way to do it is to, to, play around with it and, and see what, see what happens. Um, and this supports that. So yeah. Um, in the future, I, I, right now it's, it's a GitHub action. So it's centralized. Um, but we really think that somebody could take this code and turn it into its own profit sharing community, uh, that takes tips off of each distribution that occurs. Um, so you could have a network of, of distributor nodes, um, which allows you to distribute these tokens in a completely decentralized way. Um, 
and you know you can build a community around that um, and and make decisions based off of of, of that thing. Um, so you you can award usage tips to to the community members. Um, it's permanently decentralized infrastructure. So from from a, a founder's perspective, this is this might be attractive to people because um, the community members that are a part of like these other people's own communities that is using this mechanism uh, don't have to trust the founder to continue distributing these tokens. Um, and yeah, we, we think that's really, it's important that no one person has control over such a powerful mechanism, uh, especially in the, in the long run as the ecosystem continues to grow. Um, so yeah, if, if you want to continue to, if you want to continue developing this and, um, and take it from us and just roll with it and build it, then you're more than welcome to do so. Um, <laughs> feel free to, to get in touch with us um, if you're interested in doing that. Um, yeah, you can see Max's Discord there and, and my Discord and also our, our GitHubs. Um, and the easiest place to just get in touch with all of us is just going to the, to the, the Virto Discord. Um, yeah, because we, we'd love to chat with you and, and see we, we, we'd like to learn some things from you. And, and we also feel that, you know, we have things that, that might be able to help you as well. So yeah, <laughs> that is Astatine. Amazing. Thanks so much, Tate. Okay. That, that's super cool. So, uh, well, for a start, thank you so much for building this infrastructure for the ecosystem. I think that that's, that's going to be really valuable long term. Uh, it's like kind of nascent stage right now. Um, but like, this works. You can start using it and experimenting with it. I, right. I think one thing that, that we could like, um, make clear to people is if you want to start experimenting with this now with your profit sharing community, community, what might make sense is to, to run a very small batch, right? Yes. So set, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're right. It, it's very, we advise testing the, the mechanism, um, with yeah. your values, especially because, you know, Seeing a graph is one thing, but seeing the tokens leave your wallet and go to somebody else's, that's another. Um. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think another part of this is that like, okay, the profit sharing communities that people are building, quite a few of them are infrastructure at the moment, but increasingly we're going to see that move towards consumer facing applications or potentially business facing applications, but things that, um, they might need some maneuvering in order to find product market fit and my guess is that, um, yeah, token distribution models like this, like ownership rewards, so giving people part of the service that they're using, could be one of the the kind of secret weapons, if you like, of getting uh, profit sharing communities adopted. I really think that this is something amazing that we can offer to people using web services that you just can't get in the centralized world. Um, and if if the kind of lessons that we see from DeFi over the summer, like the power of those incentives in practice, if it plays out anything like that, um, <laughs> I think this is going to be extremely powerful for getting people to onboard to applications in, in the system. Um, but one thing I would say is that it's likely to be the case that we're going to need to tweak them, right? So normally in, in decentralized protocols, we think like there is going to be a mining reward. Like with Arweave, there's just a mining reward that, that we set right at the beginning and, and has never changed and will never change. But potentially with these profit sharing communities, it, it actually makes sense if people kind of play with the adoption rewards over time. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, just running like a small batch for like, hey, I'm running a beta. It would be great to just incentivize some people to pick up the, uh, the community and start playing with it. Then like, just, just do that, but just keep the rewards really small. No need to say, hey, this is going to be like 20% of the token supply up front or whatever. Just, right. just really tiny amounts um, could could provide a lot of value and a lot of experimentation and allow you to kind of oscillate or what's the word actually anneal towards. Um, <laughs> so India's nodding at me. I, I use annealing as an example all the time. But yeah, to, to move towards, <laughs> um, yeah, to move towards the the optimum setup for your community, like working out what it is that you should actually be rewarding. So, so I think that's super cool. Um, thanks so much for building. I'm very excited to see someone turn this into like a decentralized infrastructure piece. I think that could be great as well. Thank you. Yeah, we, we definitely are. Um, that would be the potential of that is there's so much potential. Um, yeah, we'd really love to see that.
Yeah, I mean, it makes total sense. Uh, you just like throw the program to be run by another party uh, mm -hmm. to to someone else. Um, if anyone's interested in that, Tate and I have had a few ideas along the way, of, like about what practically the the structure would need to be in order to make that possible. So just reach out to us. Uh, Tate is on the the Verto Discord. But I'm always on the Arweave Discord. <laughs> um, yeah, just send us a message, and, and we'll talk you through like what our ideas were for how this could work as infrastructure for everyone in a decentralized way. Um, other than that, so so a couple of things that I thought might be worth clarifying. One is that that this runs on GitHub at the moment, but really it's just JavaScript, right? So I can just run this locally, pretty yeah, easily, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you we yeah. actually test it locally just by running the the same script. So yeah, it's it wouldn't be too much of a process to to adapt this to something that is that runs locally. Got it. Cool. Oh, so so it's literally like I can just actually set a cron job. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is right. <laughs> okay. Nice. Well, that that's awesome. Um, and then the other thing that that from from the talk, thank you so much for giving your time to to give us the talk, by the way. Um, but the other thing that I thought just might be worth clarifying is, uh, in terms of the token allocation function, mm -hmm. how how does this work? So, if I'm starting like if I'm Phil and I'm I'm running R drive or founding R drive at least. Um, how do I how do I make it so that I'm rewarding people say for the gigabytes of the upload? How how does that actually function? So so what Phil would do, <laughs> hey Phil, um, is <laughs> he would he would um, first off you know fork the repository and in the config.js file, uh, what you would do is you would write a script or a function that um, requests somehow like. I'm not exactly sure what, what R drive's infrastructure is behind the scenes, but if it's as simple as like a, like a GraphQL query on Rweave to see how much people are uploading, um, then what you could do is you could do an Rweave, uh, query through GraphQL and receive the addresses that, that upload that data, sort it by the, the amount of data that's being uploaded, and then, um, just spit out those addresses, uh, all that matters is that this function returns a list of wallet addresses. Um, and I should mention that, you know, if Phil wanted to, I think this was something that, that he was interested in that gave us a really good idea. Um, if you wanted to add support for weighting a specific address higher than a different address, uh, we support that too. So instead of passing just a regular array back of our weave wallet addresses, you could pass uh, an array of objects with the address and then the corresponding weight beside it. Yeah, so that that's I think a really key thing to to for people to kind of grab because um, otherwise you're you're often open to civil attacks, right? So I just right. make a, a billion different wallets and then they all upload a tiny amount um, to R drive. Obviously, if you're using this system where you're waiting, then then you can make it civil resistant. So so right. that's something to think about. <laughs> Certainly. Awesome. Uh, okay. Well, I guess let's just check the chat, see if anyone's um, sure. got any questions. No, I, I think it's probably best if we move to the, the table, or the tables now, and um, yeah, <laughs> chat about this afterwards. Um, awesome. Tate, thank you so much for your time, and congratulations on building this. This is a really awesome project. Um, yeah, I want to catch up with you after about whether you plan to put like a small profit sharing community in this and then give away the... <laughs> Uh, the the majority to someone that picks it up or or not, but like we can we can work that out offline. Happy to, yeah. Thank you for having me, Sam. Amazing. All right, thanks so much, guys. We'll be jumping to the tables now.